Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a video special from Sportages. Today, I have a really special guest with me, uh, Richard Pibus, who is one of the most famous and arguably influential coaches in cricket today. He has implemented a lot of development programs and coaching programs for West Indies cricket and South Africa cricket where he was the one of the coaches on the domestic circuit and at West Indies where he was the director of cricket respectively. Richard has also coached Pakistan and Bangladesh at the international level and I believe brought forth monumental changes to the game around the world. Today Richard runs his own cricket coaching company called Cricket Lab. Welcome to the episode, Richard. How are you doing? Thanks, Hussain. I'm good. I'm good. We're obviously we're still in rural lockdown. So uh, uh, hello to all the viewers and, uh, and I hope and everybody as well. Thanks, Richard. So look, I wanted to start off a little bit uh, talking a little bit about your story. And it was really interesting when we had connected, uh, you had asked me, where are you from? It says that you're from Australia. And then I told you that, you know, I've, I've lived in all these places and I've been in Australia for about 10, 11 years now. And then you said, well, you know what? I may be from the UK, but I grew up in, in New South Wales and greater Sydney and moved around. And now you're based in South Africa. Tell me a little bit about what that has been like for you. What sort of exposure did you gain from having lived in these places? several different places in such a young age and how did that help you moving forward in life? Well, Zushan, I, I grew up, I was born in, in Newcastle in the northeast of England and uh, and for those of, you know, for your football fans out there, they'll they obviously know Newcastle from the Premier League. In the days when I was a kid, it was the first division and we were just, you know, the northeast is a hotbed of football. You know, we do, when I was growing up, I didn't know there were other sports, actually. So all we did is, you know, we just lived and breathed soccer every minute of the day, really. And and so, and, and you you end up growing up in a, in a informally very competitive environment, you know, even when you're at primary school, even pre-primary, in the sense that where we would live is the, the houses would all be in terraces, so there's always lanes behind the houses. And, and so we would just be playing soccer every minute of the day when we didn't have to go to school, quite honestly. And, uh, you know, the northeast of England, it's, um, it's, quite, a, it's quite a chilly and, and wet part of the world. And, and you know, the advice from your mum would be, you know, when you say you want to go out and play, is they, didn't, they never said no, they just said put your coat on because you <laughs> knew that, you were, you know, that there, was, there was a good chance you were going to get rained on. So you never thought about those things. And then when I was about 11, I, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, I went to a school which, which played cricket and rugby and, and I got introduced to different sports and I fell in love with both of those sports as well, which was brilliant because I, you know, I love my soccer as well. And so it was an opportunity to explore other sports and, and, um, and I think you know, when, you, when you get introduced to cricket at that type of age, it's not only the, the, the challenge of the, of the sport because it's such a, it, it's so demanding in terms of skill, yeah. but also the fact that there's so much to learn, you know, it's an intriguing sport and, and the game stops and it keeps on stopping and then only a couple of participants can take place. And, it, you know, it's quite, it's quite, it's a, it's a strange sport in that it's a team sport, but it's an individual sport within a team sport. And so I fell in love with cricket. Um, my parents emigrated to Australia when I was just, just about turning 12, I think. And we moved to Sydney, so I moved to, ended up going, I would have been still in primary school, and it would have been my first year at a high school up in the north of Sydney, a um, place called Normanhurst Boys High. For those who live in Sydney, they'll know it. And it's quite a big boys school, so it was a bit of a shock to the system. And, and again, I mean, you know, your Aussies, it was great moving from the northeast where they love their sport to move to Australia where they're just as passionate. And, and so it was, again, an incredibly competitive sporting environment. You know, we used to have cricket every Saturday morning in summer. And the dads would, the dads would be the guys who would, who would run the cricket programs. Um, obviously, the mums would support. 
but it'd be the dads really who are doing all the ferrying around in those days. And they would be the coaches and they would be the umpires. And we played on, we used to play on, on uh, the municipal fields where they would be, where it was concrete with, with a, a layer of tar on the top called Malfoy. <laughs> so they were super quick wickets. So you had to get used to playing on those, um, which is one of the reasons why I think, you know, the Australia, most Australian kids uh, would have grown up and been very comfortable with pace, obviously, mm -hmm. disregarding the fact that, because most of the kids didn't get to play on turf until they got into their mid-teens. You know, we were just, we played on those Malfoy wickets. Um, and I absolutely loved living in Sydney. Uh, sunny, you know, beach on Sunday, sport on Saturdays, school sport on Wednesdays. And, and also pretty challenging in the sense in those days, and I don't know what it's like now, but, you know, when we had school sport and you're a little 12-year-old and you're having to navigate... To get to sport, there was no school bus. You had to get, you know, you left school on a Wednesday at lunchtime and you used to have to get on the train. And we went all over Sydney on the train, having to go and you had to make your own way. So it was, that was really, um, I remember sitting on, a, sitting on a train station, I think it was Strathfield, and there were just platforms everywhere. And I wasn't quite sure which way the trains were going for me to go get back up north. It was... So there was, it was a big learning curve and you learn to become very independent. Um, and so, so, you know, now you're realizing it, you are learning, you're learning, you're, you're just assimilating this learning as you go along. And I think, you know, just growing up in, a, in, in parts of the world which are intensely competitive in sport um, and the fact that in their own ways, quite demanding in terms of, of, uh, how can I put it, the challenges on kids, really, you know? So, you know, when you look back and you, and you look back and try and understand, you know, how did, why were you so competitive? You know, why were you interested in these sports? Um, and I'm just actually finishing up a doctorate and the doctorate is, is a reflective piece. It's a piece of research, which is going back over my coaching journey, looking at the outcomes, etc. And so without getting into the psychology, you know, you do, you do, you do reflect on, you know, so what went into the types of ideas and where did they come from? So, so Sushan, you know, those would have been very formative years. My folks left Australia when I was, um, when I was in my mid teens, when I would have been about 15. So we would have had a better part of four years in, in Sydney. And then they moved up to the northwest of England, where again, just cricket crazy. You know, we lived up in North Lancashire. So again, cricket hotbeds. And I played for a team up there. I was starting to play adult cricket by then. And I played for a team called Vickers Sports, the big, uh, big shipyard in Barrow and Furness. Um, it was owned by Vickers at the time. And so I played cricket for, for Vickers Sports Club and it was absolutely brilliant. You know, I, I loved every minute of it. And, and my cricket was progressing. I started to play county juniors. And, uh, and it was just a great environment to, 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 to grow up in, really, you know, to be, being fortunate to move to parts of the world where cricket is just so deep in the, in the culture. So those would be really key formative, exp formative experiences going up to about the age of 18. Right, right. I, I just want to go into a quick segue there because there was some interesting things that I think people would probably never have asked you about or do not ask you about very often. So you are a Magpies fan then? Uh, I, I am. Yep. And well, it's been a very long, a very long journey, obviously, because yep. we've had uh, Mr. Ash, possibly a new owner of the team. So it's been a long time waiting for a little bit of uh, yeah. something to... So I think it's a good opportunity because I, I'm also a football or soccer fan to ask you this. Uh, how do you feel about the potential new takeover? And what are your thoughts yeah, on that? Very, Just very quickly. Yeah, very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to think that... I know as a Newcastle fan, you know, when I heard that there was a... Because there have been so many potential takeovers, is the is you know, to have an owner like Mike Ashley who uses the club as a business model to generate revenue, which is, there's no issues with that, but you've got to be ambitious. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're a Newcastle fan, you want to be the best side in the country. And so to have a, a, a guy, have an owner that would, you know, is quite happy to sell off your best players and, and have really no ambition whatsoever has been, has been extremely tough. Um, to have a club owned by 
the Saudi royal family or the sovereign trust or whatever it is, is, yeah, it, it raises some, some, some questions which I think that the Premier League are going to have to be, and UEFA even, you know, mm. is with their human rights record, is I really, I, I just don't see it being compatible, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so it'll be interesting to see where they go. And I've, you know, I've done some hard thinking about it because, um, you know, your love for your team doesn't change, but the fact of them getting taken over, you can't blame the fans for, for, for the sale of a club. Yeah. But you really don't want your club getting taken over by somebody who, who has got such a terrible right, uh, record on human rights. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll leave the I'll leave the football there. I just did want to hear your insights on that very quickly. Uh, you obviously mentioned how you know you spent your life till about you were eighteen, got into junior cricket. Those were the formative years, and then comes your own cricketing career, which unfortunately was hampered by injuries uh, and. Was it, am I right in saying that it was the injuries that forced you to give up on that career? Yeah, 100%. You know, yeah. I wouldn't even go forward to say of having a career, you know, it never really yeah. got started. I, um, I was in a car accident in Sydney, actually. I went back, on, went back to Sydney when I was 18 to go and play cricket in the, in the English winter. My cricket had been going really well. Um, that year, that winter, actually, I'd been asked to go down and, and train with Lancashire because I was playing the, the old county boundaries. I lived in, in North Lancashire, um, but the new county boundaries, the county was called Cumbria. So I played against, you know, we would play all the junior provincial, junior county tournaments. So my cricket was going really well. And, uh, and I was in a car accident in Sydney when I, was, when I went back and that I got um, quite a badly injured back. And that really over the course of probably the next four years um, is, I just ended up with one injury after another and it was to do with it was you know it, it stemmed from the back injury and i ended up having about five operations in six years or five operations in about five years i can't remember what it was but i just seemed to be going to hospital every every year really and and i just you know i got into my early 20s i had an opportunity to go up to worcestershire with the county champions at the side at the time and because i was playing at the time, I would have been about 21. I would have been playing minor counties. And, and I went up there and I got injured. It was only in my first week of going up there. And, and I couldn't get it diagnosed for six months. And then I had to have an operation. And so it went on. And eventually, I just said, this is ridiculous. You know, um, I'd been getting supported by my parents. I'd finished my university education. I didn't have any money. You know, I'd been hanging and hanging and hanging. And I made a call and I just thought, right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm actually going to move on from trying to play because it's, um, I just don't, I'm not making any progress whatsoever. And yeah, it was the right call. I mean, it was incredibly difficult. You was, it's, um, you know, when you have to let go of your, I suppose, your lifelong dreams. Um, so it was a pretty challenging period, but, you know, my, my passion for sport didn't change. And, and I had, you know, I had been informally coaching since I was 16, um, you know, helping, helping at school, helping, helping at other schools when I had an opportunity to go and um, help my uh, a friend's mother with her primary school, which was like a, in a break when I wasn't, when I wasn't at school. So I I'd, I'd got introduced to coaching and, um, and I did, and I, and I, would eat and with the rugby I'd coach rugby as well so it was something I really started to enjoy and it just seemed like a very natural transition that's that's really interesting I do want to dwell on the coaching a bit further but before that you know you talked about the challenges uh that it was a very challenging time for you when of course and as it would be for anyone else I mean in uh the physical side of it, of course, there are those injuries, but then there's so much to the mental uh, well-being side of it. And in today's day and age, there is still significant, albeit not enough, but significant awareness around issues like that. And, you know, we've seen cricketers like Glenn Maxwell here in Australia recently and some of the players on the domestic circuit who've come out and said, hey, you know, I need a break because my mental health is something I need to work on. When you... 
went through all of these injuries and you re- recognize that, hey, you know, I'm not going to be able to become that fast bowler that I want to be um, at, at, a, at a professional level. How did you sort of overcome what you were thinking of, especially uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong in saying, but at a time when uh, the awareness around the psychology of sport and mental health and well-being in sport wasn't prominent or prevalent? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, looking back, I mean, when I say it was a tough time, it was an unbelievably tough time because, you know, you are, you, you, your identity is wrapped up in your sport. I mean, all I ever did was play sport. I played sport every single weekend of the year. Um, When my mates at college would be going off to go and go to Europe and go on holiday and, and go and see bands and stuff. I had no interest, you know? So summer was for, for cricket and, and rugby was for winter and that was it. Um, when your identity is wrapped up in that, when your self-esteem comes from that, when your confidence, when who you think you are at an unconscious level is actually made up of that. And then you are not that anymore because you can't express yourself. Is uh, it was, yeah, it was, I won't, I won't, I won't say it lightly. It was a really, really tough time. I was really depressed, and, and my self-esteem, self-confidence just evaporated. And it was, and it took a long time to to get over that. And um, and I, you know, I can I can see how when for anybody when when they have to go through experiences like that and you know i didn't lose my health really i just had some injuries and i couldn't pursue what i wanted to do uh is but when we have a when our identity is wrapped up in something and we have to change tack because we can't because we can't continue down that path and and that's where your self-esteem comes from then then yeah it, it really is an issue it's not about sports but anybody who experiences that and I think particularly in your early 20s when, you know, you're still trying to work out who you are and where you fit and, you know, you haven't really got started, you know. We have to go through school and if you go to, and then you go off to work or tertiary education is you are still working out who you are and where you fit in. And um, so I think as a coach, I've, I think it's when I look back, you know, I always think as a coach, I had a, I had a head start on all other coaches, really. You know, I started coaching at such a young age. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, when I finished, when I during that period um i started i went back to uni uh, i didn't have any work i went back to uni and i did what was known as a postgraduate certificate of education which is which is where you learn to to teach what you do in your first degree so so that was an, that was a fantastic experience for me and and to really understand how people learn and how you share that how you design a syllabus and curriculum and how that goes together and I think that was that was very informative in the sense that in those days, that would have been in the very early 90s, is that, you know, there wasn't a, there wasn't really a coaching, a theoretical framework for coaching, which was laid out. Um, you know, it was all around physical education. So coaching, coaching as a specialist area was still evolving, even though, you know, there was such, such a thing as a coach in sport. Although I think, and even, even I remember in the 90s when I was doing my my level three and four in South Africa, when you when you're getting coached on co- or educated in coaching, and people are talking about about uh, what is a coach, what is the role of the coach, what are they accountable for? You know, when I look back and the stuff that people are coming up with, I, it's like bizarre. You know, <laughs> is that you were all things to all people, but of course you're not. That's not what a coach is. So, mm. so yeah, so you know. Lemons and lemonade, adversity rising up on the wings, wings of adversity. You know, is is you you. There are lots of ways of of, of looking at it, but um, goals are really important. Goals about things that you are passionate about are really really important, and that to me is not about psychology. It is is it is about connecting with with your passion, and if. If one avenue is closed off, is you stay following your passion, but you explore different opportunities. And and if I'd known that then, obviously, is um, is it wouldn't have been such a long transition period for me. 
but I do know it now and I can share that with other people. Sure, sure, sure. And now let's move on, I guess, to your coaching career itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting off from, would, would it be right of me to call it your love affair with South Africa? Because, you know, you've, you've coached there and returned and coached there and returned. And now, you know, you are, you have been there. So in a way, uh, you've, you've, you do have some significant sort of um, connection to the, to the yeah. country. You tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so, so when I finished my PGCE, uh, I didn't really, I mean, I just wanted to go and coach. Um, and I made a decision when I was doing the, doing the PGCE that I, 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 I needed to get experience as a coach. Um, it gave me a great grounding, but I wasn't immediately going to go into, into in, I mean, I trained to, to, to lecture at, for, in further education. So it was, it was always a position that I could go and fall back on, and I, and I loved the subjects which I taught, but, you know, I really wanted to go and coach, and I wanted experience, and I wanted opportunity, and at that time, South Africa was opening up, and I had been released from prison, um, and it was outside of the, the English season, so obviously in the UK, in the Northern Hemisphere, the, you're looking for opportunities in the moment. Northern Hemisphere winter. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back to Australia. I've been there and I've done that. So uh, South Africa looked like a, a, a great place to go and get opportunity, go there for six months. And so I took the initiative. I wrote to, I wrote to Ali Bacha, who was the CEO, which might sound like quite a big step from Johnny Nobody from Johnny Nowhere, really. But I just thought, you know, I need to get a response from somebody who can give me the right answer. So I wrote to Ali. And he replied and he sent me the details of all the provincial presidents. And I wrote to all the provincial presidents and I started getting responses. And my letter ended up on the, on the desk of uh, the headmaster of Selborne College in, in East London in the Eastern Cape. And he phoned me up one day and I thought it was one of my mates from rugby calling me to, to, to pull my leg. And I had to stop myself from using some uh, inappropriate language. And I just listened to this guy. And, um, and he said, listen, we'd like you to come out and be our professional coach for six months. Are you interested? And so that's how it all started. And I went out and I absolutely loved it. It was great, great facilities, great kids. Staff were brilliant. Loved it. Went back to England. At that stage, I was still playing some club cricket as much, you know, without any competitive ambitions then, but just because I still wanted to play. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, and, and then I met a young South African lady. Uh, we got married. We got had a beautiful, not that I did the having, but we've uh, got a beautiful 25-year-old uh, daughter now. And, and so I stayed, and during the, during the winter, I would teach and, and, and coach rugby. And in, in the summer, I was the pro coach. And the side did, the cricket did exceptionally well. We started producing a lot of provincial players. And as they went through, I got acknowledged. And we play against all the, all the big traditional uh, boys' colleges. And, and, and that's, that's how it rolled. And the better we did, the more I came into the spotlight. Not that it was about that. But, you know, success breeds success. And then I got asked to go to, to work for the first class setup to run the youth program there and coach the under-19s. And around the 19s did well. We went to the national championships and we were, we, you can't call it a winner, but we were the only unbeaten side there. And we, four of those lads got into the South African under 19 side, which was the first for the province. And, 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 the, and your, your viewers will know the names of these guys, Mark Boucher, Mackay Teeny, Justin Kemp, you know, all went on to play for South Africa from that side. Mark was the captain of that side. There's a few test caps in that team. And, um, and so, and, and so that's how that's how the progression up the ladder started. Right, right, right. So I mean, my I, I didn't know that, you know, you obviously uh, your your wife is South African, but I just put in the love affair. And it so just turned out that that is the case, which is which fits in fantastically from the perspective of an interview. But yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, it's it's really interesting because obviously this was the first set of players, so Makai Antini, Mark Boucher, Justin Kemp, but 
it's continued on with a lot of the players who've come out the ranks of South African cricket to then go on to play at the highest level for reg- regular periods, significant amount of time. Um, I was initially thinking of talking to you about it from how you progress to each uh, or, or progressed. I wouldn't say progressed, but moved on across each uh, area that you worked in and each country that you worked in. But I think that instead of that being mount- mindful of time, uh, tell me a little bit about being in that South African cricket structure back when South Africa was opening up. To where it is now and having seen, you know, some of the finest uh, cricketers to play the game, come out from South Africa, perform phenomenally, you know, be it A.B. de Villiers, be it Hashim Amla, Imran Tahir, whoever so it is, all the way to now when people are saying and bringing up questions like, is this the, and I and I don't want to sound tabloidist, tabloid-esque but then at the same time I do recognize that South African cricket isn't where it was uh, 10 or even five years ago and tell me could you tell me a little bit about how it's got into the stage that it's at now and is the perception really true okay it's usually a minor correction um, yeah. my 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 daughter is 25 and mom and i are no longer together uh oh. so she, my, you know, just a correction there. my apologies yeah. No, yeah that's cool um yeah so so where are we in south african cricket what are the changes you know it is we live in you know it's a democracy i mean when i went when i moved to south africa is the anc had been unbanned um uh, the first election, the first democratic election, was in '94, and so it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a very young country. It's a very young country, and there has been a, a peaceful revolution. Um, there would have been an exchange of power, and and South Africa is made up of just so many different communities and and population groups. And you know, people think of Africa and they think Africans are black. You know, South Africa's history is very different to that in the sense that there are there are lots of different tribes in South Africa, and there are nine official languages, if I if I remember correctly. So you imagine you've got nine languages in one country, um, and so there are lots of different population groups, and there would be lots of populations that would have come to South Africa at different historical periods. So it really is a melting pot of people. And, and those people would be from Europe, they would be from Asia, um, there, would be, there would be people, there would be uh, Africans from different parts of Africa who would have, who would have come down in periods like the, the, the Zulus who would have originally moved down from the north. Um, and so it really is, it's been an incredible 20 plus years, longer than that, 25 years of, of the country working through without being looking back too much because obviously time moves forward Mm -hmm. is is transitioning into into uh, a democracy which which represents all the people and you know sports a great metaphor for 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 life and and that's been one of the one of the binding things in south african culture is the fact that um as the sports teams have evolved and become more representative, particularly in sports like the international sports like rugby and cricket, is that they are representing those communities now far more than they did in the past. And as as for those who would be rugby lovers, who would have seen with the, you know, with the balance of the South African team that won the last Rugby World Cup, is, you know, it was a team from all communities. And, and, And in that, of itself, it brings communities together. It breaks those boundaries down. So I've got to say, it's been an incredible, it's been an incredible journey. The country would have had its political challenges the last decade, uh, would have been very challenging politically because there was a lot of uh, corruption at a senior level in government. And, and that would have really impacted right across the population because investment that should have gone into education, schools, hospitals, et cetera, didn't, didn't get to its destination. 
And so economically, it's been very tough. There is a new, there's uh, a relatively new uh, political government dispensation now with a new president um, and seeking to address those challenges and, and, uh, and, and to move forward in a far more, um, how can I put it, in a, in a more ethical way. Mm -hmm. uh, where would what would what would be the change in South African cricket? You know what's really interesting is the fact that you know the, the, a cricketer a cricketer's primary learning whenever they up you know whether it be boys and girls when they first pick up a bat and a ball. So that learning's really taking place between the ages of about six and sixteen, eight and eighteen, relative to when they start the game, and that's a decade's worth of learning, whether it's informal whether it's formal at school, how they get that learning is, you know, when we're in childhood, and particularly when it's informal and, and boys and girls are just playing out in, out in the playground, out in the street, you know, out in uh, um, um, parts of, of land, you know, where you can find a patch, you know, you come from subcontinents, so you know that wherever there's an open pair, piece of ground, kids will congregate, adults will congregate, they'll just start playing cricket. Yeah. And so that's informal learning, but, 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 you know, the kids don't need a book. They just learn by play. And so that learning process is, is pretty much done by the time the uh, individual gets to 18. And if they've, got, if, they, if they've got a level of talent which allows them to be competitive and, and move through uh, levels of representative cricket to get to a level where they would move through regional, possibly into provincial or county or state and get identified to be able to play at a higher level um, is then they get put into more formal coaching structures to be able to refine the skill sets and the understanding around game strategy. Um, so schools have a critical role to play in that. But again, you know, if you don't go to a great cricket school, then you're going to learn like I did. You know, we didn't have much of a cricket program at school when I moved back to the UK. So the, so the, so the learning's done at club. You know, and you, you're assimilating that learning down the nets. And if you're a boy or a girl, you're assimilating that from the adults. Um, in a South African context, historically, most of the great players would have come through a very small group of schools. Uh, the development program, which would have started in the 90s, well, it would have started earlier in that, but it, but it became, there was very heavy financial commitment in the 90s to the development program to take the game out to, to, to the outside of, outside of the traditionally white population groups um, and, and to identify cricketers amongst, particularly amongst the black population. Um, at that stage in South Africa's history, cricket, the cricket had come, become part of the community in the Eastern Cape in the, in the um, 1880s when settlers first moved out and they started playing there. Um, and picked up the game. So historically, it was very deep in the in the, the the black culture of the Eastern Cape, and and that would have been the the heartbeat of black African cricket. And and just for the viewers, because it you know South Africa is a very the the demo, the, the demographics in South Africa are very um, clear in the way that the cricket has developed. Um, and so a big Asian population ended up in Natal because they went out there as uh, demented laborers. So, so there's a huge Asian community in Natal, absolutely cricket crazy. That, that would be the, you know, the, I would say the four bearers of people like Hashim and um, his brother Ahmed and a whole host of cricketers from Natal. And as you move down the coast into the Cape Colored community, uh, where you've got guys like Herschel Gibbs, J.P. Dumini, etc. You know, so so the demographics in, in in terms of where players come from in South Africa is quite is demographically it's geographically based primarily, um, and so those those players would have evolved from different cricket subcultures. And so what we've what's happened is when those players have got to first class level, they would have evolved through particular coaching systems coaching programs and typically players who would have evolved through through winning combinations um, the great South African player and coach Eddie Barlow moved to moved to coach the free state in the late 80s and 90s uh, 
And, and so that would have been the era when guys like Alan Donald and Hansi Cronier came through from free state. Um, you know, in my time, when I started coaching the first class level, uh, Duncan Fletcher was the coach of Western province. Um, that is down the Cape from where I would have lived in the Eastern Cape in East London. Uh, I coached border. So Mark and Makaya would be emerging players for us. Justin Kemp had gone off to play for the next province down the road, which was Eastern province whose captain was Kepler Vessels. Um, and so groups of players would come through with coaches. And I think that, you know, the primary coaches when I was coaching in South Africa is Duncan Fletcher was coming to the end of his tenure of co as a first-class coach in South Africa. Um, that would have been in 99. He then moved to England. The Natal coach, Graham Ford, uh, you know, Graham would have coached South Africa, he would have coached Sri Lanka. Um, uh, is there was a group of players who came through with Graham, which would be the Sean Pollocks, the John T. Rhodes, the Lance Klusners. And then when I look at the next group of players, they primarily would come through with me at the Titans, and that would be guys like Dale Stane, Mornay Morkel, Albion Morkel, Faf Du Plessis. And you end up, Imrata here, um, you'd end up with groups of players who would become the core group of players in a team. And so to go back to your original question about where is the team at, where's the team at now, is how important the, the coaching, the, the quality of the coaching system in terms of player production is. And, you know, in, in Fletcher's tenure at Western Province, you know, guys like Gary Kirsten would have come through under Duncan, mm -hmm. um, Jacques Callis, Herschel Gibbs, etc. So we're looking at players coming together, uh, evolving out of coaching structures and how those players are getting finished at a first class level to make that next step into international. And obviously when you, when you, in terms of player production, you want that gap between first class and international to be as small as possible. You want as, as smooth a transition as possible. It doesn't work like that in reality. You know, I know that like for Dale and Hash, they both got dropped from the international side twice. AB got dropped. You know, as you come back, you have to do your learning and you have to go back and, 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 and close the gap on that learning to be able to succeed at international level. Um, where is South Africa at right now? Um, I have some real concerns in terms of, from a coaching point of view, is that there needs to be a transmission of coaching knowledge within a system. And, you know, where I would have, had, where I would have been very fortunate to get exposure to guys like Eddie Barlow and Bob Warmer, and to be able to learn from them. Um, uh, and the great experience of coaching against guys like Duncan and, and Graham Ford is that you have the intellectual capital, your knowledge capital within your cricket system is is uh, that stage. And historically in South Africa, it would have been around com one community and there wouldn't have been a lot of cross-cultural transfer. So you've got a bigger, you've got a bigger cultural cricket community, um, which would, which, would broaden that conversation but the transmission of that that coaching capital needs to go down generationally and and when those coaches are not in the system or they're on the outside of the system for whatever reason is you don't get that transmission and that's so important because until south africa starts producing a quality of player that will operate and and not just compete at international level but dominate South at uh, international level they're not going to they're not going to remotely get close to to being back at number one and i saw this week they've gone down to i think it's number six in the test rankings and that is i mean that's a serious decline over a period of time um and i'm not sure what their one their one day ranking is but you know they ended up at eight at the world cup from a side that historically they would have they would have uh, at least been semi-finalists, even if they hadn't managed to transition the semi-finals, they would have been competitive up to that. Well, that, that sounds really interesting, Richard, and I really appreciate your time. I think what we're going to do for today is we'll wrap things up, and for our viewers and listeners, stay tuned because we still have a lot to talk about. Uh, there are several questions that I have for Richard, in regards to his career, and I feel that we're somewhere around that 
halfway point, but that's only if we make it the halfway point. Um, and we will be back again with Richard uh, very shortly. So stay tuned for the next video where we'll be talking about his time in the subcontinent, coaching Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, his time as the director of cricket at the West Indies Cricket Board, and of course, very importantly, what he's up to now, which is his own cricketing, uh, cricket coaching company, Cricket Lab. So stay tuned. Thanks a lot, Richard. And I look forward to speaking to you again very shortly. Thanks, Ishan. Yeah.